Welcome. I thought I'd try something a little different and do a voiceover for this video. For the three of you who might watch this, my apologies if you get sick of my voice. There's always a mute button if you do. Anyway, these chunks of pine are from some friends who had a tree cut down in their northern Wisconsin property. They came to me a little wet and still with some rot. So I let them dry in the basement for a few weeks, which produced a nice pine scent. Everyone loved that. So here I am working with an electric planer to flatten the underside of the wood. This will help me to further flatten the wood in the near future. And here's really where I made my first mistake, uh, shaping before flattening. I got impatient and wanted to trim the wood down to the coffee table shape before I got to the right thickness. I tried the coping saw, but, well, that didn't work so well. If I'd flattened the wood first, I could have used my band saw or jigsaw. That's lesson number one learned. Hey, do you know why pediatricians make terrible woodworkers? They have little patience. <clears throat> So I spent some time trying to match up the curve of this wood. This wood is way too thick and I need to plane it down. I don't have access to a large thickness planer because my neighbor's is only 13 inches wide. Some neighbor. So I'm building a router flattening sled. This will allow me to make the wood an even thickness. I'm using some leftover melamine for shelving and some other scraps. Bonus, it produces a ton of sawdust or man glitter. To make this work, I clamped some scraps of wood between two pieces of steel. This would allow the router to run along the steel as I go back and forth on the sled. Mistake number two comes into play here, and that's not making it idiot proof. You can see the clamps are flat, which allowed the steel to fall off the side rails and gouge the router bit into the wood. I learned lesson number two, and turn those clamps to keep it from happening. Mistake number three was not using the right equipment. I don't own a good router or a router flattening bit, but my father-in-law does. It definitely would have made my life easier, but impatience got the better of me. Lesson number three I learned was to use the right tools when you can. Part of making is being creative and using the tools you have to finish the job. But if you have access to good tools, take advantage. After the flattening process, I used some of the penetrating epoxy to help stabilize the wood. This is a total boat product and my first experience using it. I have to say, I'm pretty impressed with their product and customer service as we did have an issue with shipping and they corrected it very fast. With the wood stabilized, I needed to make sure the cracks didn't keep opening up. I'm making some bow ties or checks to insert across the cracks and help prevent future movement. The idea is that the hardwood bow tie has a different grain pattern and doesn't allow the cracks to open up any further. The edges of the bow tie need to be chamfered so that they'll fit a little bit more easily into their spots. And here I'm cleaning up the chisel to do that. Hey, what do you call a piece of wood with nothing to do? Board. Hey, if you're still with me after that one, here I'm in the process of cutting out the holes in the pine for those bow ties. I used a router to get the majority of the cavity formed, then finished up with a sharp chisel. I somehow must film in gluing these in place, but you can probably imagine what it was. After the glue dried, I took my flush trim saw and a block plane to finish them off. A little sanding off camera and we're starting to look like a top. Time to work on the steel base. Pretty sure the steel yard doesn't have a lot of people pick up their raw materials in a Volkswagen Passat or show up wearing business casual. But my neighbor did redeem himself and let me borrow his chop saw to cut down all the steel to the right size. After that, I did a little grinding to prepare for the welding. I'm not an expert on welding by any stretch of the imagination, but I can use this hot metal glue gun to make two pieces of metal stick together. After tacking the corners, I put some full weld beads on, which aren't going to win any awards or certifications. 
By the way, when I was doing this, I did have a child ask me if I was electrocuting myself. Probably not far from the truth. After grinding some of the welds on the legs, I was able to weld the pieces of angle on as the stretchers. And you can see that here. This worked out well, and I was starting to get more comfortable with the welding. You know how they say measure once and cut twice? Wait, measure twice, cut once? Well, my grandpa always used to joke about that and say, if it's too short, we can always add on. But if it's too long, what do we do? Well, guess what? Mistake number four was making the base too long. Fortunately, it was an easy fix, and I was able to take care of it without too much trouble. I fixed it off camera, and then finished up with the grinding and the paint. I've heard it said, grinding and paint makes you the welder you ain't. So very true. Next up is the fun part, epoxy resin. Right away I began with mistake number five, and that's using the wrong tape. I just used a basic painter's tape to cover the cracks. I know I've seen tons of videos where experts use something like an aluminum tape to cover the cracks, but did I listen? Of course not. This was cheaper. But I quickly learned that the epoxy found small openings and began to leak out. Again, we're using Total Boat for the epoxy. This worked out really well. <clears throat> I enlisted the help of my wife to pour. We ended up doing the first pour, waiting for it to dry, and then trying again. And again. And again. And eventually we got to the point where the cracks had been filled and the whole surface was covered. It was starting to come together and look like something. Uh, honestly, at first I was a little worried that this wasn't going to turn out. So as the epoxy began to cure, bubbles came to the surface. We used a torch to apply some heat and pop some of those bubbles, which worked very nicely. Fire. Did I mention sanding? Well, after I pulled off all of this tape, which, again, not using the best tape made it a little more difficult. There was a lot of scraping and peeling and more scraping and more peeling and then sanding and sanding and sanding and sanding and sanding. More sanding. More sanding. Sorry, you, you don't want to watch this, do you? Back to the fun stuff. This is a stencil that my wife cut out on her vinyl cutter. It's actually a picture of a tattoo that she had converted to a printable file. It has a very special meaning to our friends and is going on the underside of the table. Once the stencil had dried, it was time for some wipe on polyurethane. I applied several coats to bring out the shine. It's pretty satisfying to see the wood come alive after the first coat of polyurethane goes on. It's the final assembly, which is a relief. It's just a matter of attaching the base to the top along with some pads for the base, so it doesn't scratch up the floor. As we were delivering the table, my daughter asked, Isn't it nice that you actually finished something? Yeah, I guess. Anyway, this has been a really fun and challenging project. I thought the table turned out great. More importantly, I learned a few things along the way. Hopefully you did too. And hey, thanks for watching. Thank you.